you've already read the little blurbs about our speakers tonight, that it's Cindy Ainsworth on the Ross or Roos Tapestry. I don't know which way I'm supposed to pronounce that. Dick Jones on the graphical representation of arches, Elaine Krieg on the roof bosses of Norwich Cathedral, and Linda Papanakawa on the survival of medieval forms of poetry from Japan. All right, we will start in the same order as it's always been listed with Cindy first. Hey everybody, um, I should be able to share my screen, right? Um, so Bob and I um, learned about the Ross tapestries when we were making plans for our trip to Ireland. We were in Ireland in August and September. And then we were fortunate that we were able to see the tapestries at Kilkenny Castle. So what are the tapestries? They are four, 15 um, large embroidered panels. They're roughly four feet high by six feet wide. And they depict the early history of the Normans in Ireland. Um, the Normans first arrived in 1169. And while they were initially invited in by Dermot McMurrow, deposed King of Leinster, most of the native Irish viewed them as invaders and their arrival marked the beginning of centuries of conflict between Ireland and England. The panels cover the events from about 1150 to 1220. So where is Ross? Ross is a town. Um, and the Ross Tapestry Project was the brainchild of Reverend Paul Mooney um, pastor of St. Mary's Church in the town of New Ross. And, um, in talking about the tapestries, Ross and New Ross are really um, interchangeable. Um, inspired by the famous Bayou Tapestry in France, Reverend Mooney came up with the idea of creating a series of tapestries to display in his church that would commemorate the Norman history of the area. Um, the first Normans landed at the Banno Strand, which is actually down on the coast, south of where the little uh, red bu bubble is. Um, but they traveled then up the River Barrow to the area around Ross, where they settled and prospered. And the current town of New Ross replaced Ross as the town grew. So Reverend Mooney's church, the current St. Mary's church, is built within the ruins of this original Norman cathedral, which was built in 1210. Um, we did not have a chance to visit the town of no New Ross, so we didn't see the ruins in person, but they look pretty impressive. I'd love to go at some point. I thought it would be helpful to list the key players that I'm going to be talking about. Um, I've already mentioned Dermot McMurrow. He was the king of Leinster. Um, Aifa uh, McMurrow, his daughter. Richard de Clare, de, uh, who was the Earl of Pembroke and also known as Strongbow, generally known as Strongbow. Um, Isabel de Clare, daughter of Aoife and Strongbow. William Marshall, Earl of Pembroke, who married Isabel, and uh, King Henry II, who was the king at the time that the Normans arrived in Ireland. I've chosen one of the 15 panels to tell part of the story of the Normans and to talk about the creation of the tapestries. I do have slides at the end that show all 15 panels. Um, each panel is covered with cruel, and cruel inspired embroidery in wool on a linen background. Over 150 volunteer stitchers have worked on the panels. The work started in 1998 and the first panel was completed in 2001. At this point, all the panels have been completed except one and stitchers are currently working to complete the last one. Um, each panel has a primary scene in the center um, with top and bottom borders that show small vignettes related to the main scene. The main scene in this panel, panel six, is actually divided into two sections, each of which shows a wedding. So uh, uh, Dermot McMurrow, the former King of Leinster, had been deposed in 11, 7, 1166, and he wanted to recapture his kingdom. So he appealed to King Henry II for support. Henry agreed that McMurrow could seek support among Henry's mercenaries and soldiers, and to enlist the support of Richard de Clare, Earl of Pembroke, known as Strongbow, McMurrow promised him the hand of his daughter Aoife in marriage and the right of succession after his death. De Clare and his forces arrived in Ireland in 1170, where he in fact married Aoife and helped Dermot McMurrow recapture his kingdom. Um, Strongbow became King of Leinster after McMurrow's death in 1171. That's the marriage that's pictured at the top up here. Um, 
The marriage helped to legitimize Strongbow's claim to succeed um, McMurrow as King of Leinster. Um, Aoife and Strongbow had two children, a son, a son who died very young and a daughter, Isabel. Um, the bottom half of the, of the panel shows the marriage of Isabel and Aoife to William Marshall in 1189. Um, William was granted Isabel's hand in marriage by King Henry II as a reward for his consistent bravery and enduring loyalty. It's not clear how either Aoife or Isabel felt about these arranged marriages, as their husbands were quite a bit older than they were. But William and William Marshall and Isabel had 10 children, um, five girls and five boys, so they apparently got along pretty well. This is the top border for uh, uh, panel six. Um, said, and it shows the antecedents of the couples, the Viking ships for uh, uh, Strongbow and William Marshall and the Celtic chariot for Aoife and Isabel. Yeah, so this is the left, oops, I can move my cursor here. So this is the left half of the top border. This is the center of the top border and this is the right half of the bottom border, or top border. The right side of the bottom border shows Isabel being carried in a litter from the White Tower of London where she had been living. The center of the border shows William and Isabel and their 10 children. And the left side isn't, isn't um, described on the Tapestry Project's website, but um, Bob and I think it might be showing the gifts that Marshall, who was very wealthy, um, presented to his new wife. So again, this is the left side of the bottom border. This is the middle and this is the right. This is the panel that is still being worked, which is panel five. Um, the process for creating each panel is somewhat complicated. For each panel, there's a painted cartoon, painted cartoon, um, uh, that illustrates the image for that panel. A large piece of a clear acrylic is then placed over the cartoon and the outline of the images are traced by hand onto the piece of acrylic. The acrylic sheet is then placed on a light box and the fabric for the panel is laid out over the acrylic so that the image is projected onto the fabric. The images are then drawn onto the fabric with a pencil. The fabric is then um, stitched onto the embroidery loom so that the work of actual embroidery can begin. The original cartoon stays with the stitchers as a guide for stitching. Um, you can see the cartoon uh, in the photo. Um, the borders are created separately and then sewn onto the main panel. Um, and this is, as I said, this is panel five. The stitchers used seven or eight basic stitches in what they like to call needle painting, um, where the goal is to create a feeling of shape, texture, and movement. The stitchers were all trained by a local textile expert. This is a closer up look at the um, women who were stitchers who were working on this panel. This is the tracing that I mentioned. So you can see that it's really up to the stitchers. There's not much to, uh, uh, that's actually on the fabric to guide the stitchers. They're really, it's their responsibility to take the, the cartoon that they're looking at and translate it into the appropriate stitches and colors on the, um, on the fabric. And this gives you, gives you um, just a, a glimpse of the various colors that, were that are available to the stitchers as they were working to create the picture. This is a close-up view of, of panel five as it's being worked. And I think it does a better job of giving you the, the sense of the stitches and what the stitches look like close up. Um, the project became a true community project with groups of stitchers set up around the county of Wexford and in Kilkenny. They've worked in a variety of venues from private houses to community centers, converted cow sheds, cow sheds a castle and a fort. Um, the tapestries were to be displayed in St. Mary's Church, but the project organizers soon realized that they would be too large. There is now a purpose-built display center in New Ross, which uh, has been closed um, for the last couple of years because of COVID. The tapestries are currently on display in Kilkenny Castle, which is where Bob and I saw them, um, but they will eventually go back to New Ross. A quick look at the other panels. Um, panel one is Celts, an, an island fastness, and it shows the coronation of a young king under the ancient laws that governed everyday life in Ireland prior to the invasion of the Normans. Um, the second panel uh, is the abduction of Dervagila. 
Um, Dervagila was the wife of another king, and she was abducted by Dermot McMurrow. And that it was this abduction that a few years later led to McMurrow's having been deposed as king of Leinster. There's, a, there's an incredible amount of detail in each of these. Um, and so, I, you know, in you know, trying to keep the talk to 15 minutes, I'm, um, I'm definitely giving just a high level view. Panel three is uh, the arrogant trespass, the Normans landing at Banno. Um, so McMurrow sought help from Henry II, as I mentioned, to regain his throne. And in 1169, a small band of Norman knights and soldiers led by Robert Fitzstevens landed at Banno on the south coast of Ireland. So this is prior to the arrival of uh, uh, Richard de Clare, Earl of Pembroke. Um, Panel four is the siege of Wexford. Wexford is a town uh, not too far from Ross. Uh, or, uh, and um, this, this particular panel shows a perspective from above as the soldiers are, um, uh, uh, forces led by McMurrow and Fitzstephen are um, fighting to take the town of Wexford. Panel five, uh, battles in the kingdom of Ossory. Um, in the summer of 1169, after taking Wexford, McMurrow's forces headed to Ossory in County Kilkenny. Um, there they defeated the forces of the King of Ossory who had led the effort to depose McMurrow as King of Leinster. Um, panel five is the one we showed. Um, and so this image is of the cartoon, not of the actual panel. And then panel six is the wedding panel that we looked at earlier. Um, panel seven, William Marshall, the flower of chivalry. Um, the panel shows the three stages of William Marshall's life. In the foreground, we see a young William guarding Prince Henry, the firstborn son of Henry II. Behind this, William is depicted as a knight as he made his name as a tournament champion, reputedly undefeated. Um, and the final image of William is of him at the, bill, at the pinnacle of his power following his marriage to um, Isabel de Clare. Panel eight, uh, is the Marshall, William Marshall's stormy crossing to Ireland. Um, 11 years after his marriage in England to Isabel, um, William was given permission to move to Ireland. And this panel shows the stormy sea crossing. Panel nine is the hunt in the forest of Ross. Um, having safely arrived in Ireland, William enjoyed exploring the wild and beautiful estates that he had inherited from his marriage to Isabel. The panel shows William, Isabel, and her Irish cousins hunting in the forest near Ross. And then 10 is a Gothic glory, the building of the parish church of St. Mary in 1210. William and Isabel founded the town of New Ross with the intention of creating a town that would rival nearby Waterford. The building of a grand new church, St. Mary's Cathedral, was an important part of the plan. The panel shows Isabel leaning over a mapping table, Isabel in the mapping table, um, and then William sitting on a horse is reviewing the plans. Um, the large figure on the right is Dermot McMurray, whose outreached arm uh, claiming credit for the news church. You can, you can see the, the, the ruins of the church compared to the original structure of the church. Um, Panel 11, evening, lighthouse at Hook Head. The Hook Lighthouse was built around 1207 to safeguard the entrance to the Barrow Estuary, um, protect the passage to Waterford and the emerging port of Ross, and facilitate opening up the province to trade. So this panel shows one of William Marshall's men overseeing the lighting of the beacon while ships are tossed on stormy, stormy seas. Um, the lighthouse is actually still in active use. Panel 12 is the thriving port of Ross. Um, due to his prominent standing in England and beyond, Marshall was easily able to acquire the services of quality shipbuilders and attract merchants and bankers to assure that New Ross developed into one of the finest ports in Europe. Um, this panel shows the port of New Ross in approximately 1220. In the center of the panel, we see the Italian bankers um, presiding over the port's comings and goings, while to the right, Cistercian monks are carrying wool the single most important export to the ship, to the ships. An Irishman awaits payment for his horse and a colleague ties on a shaggy mantle, which was a peculiarly Irish garment, much softer, so sought after abroad, as were Irish falcons and hunting dogs. 
And so here are the merchants. Um, uh, panel 13, the walling of Ross. 16 guilds protect their town. The town survived for 58 years with no surrounding protective wall. However, infighting among Normans from the surrounding area began to threaten the town. So in 1265, the merchant guilds decided they needed to build a 20 foot wide ditch around the town for protection. All 16 guilds helped with the construction and the women joined in the work on the Sundays. So the panners, panels shown um, here are the banners of the guilds. And then you can see the women on the upper right arriving to do their part of the work. Panel 14 is the exchange. Um, the arrival of the Normans brought great prosperity to Ross and the surrounding area. Reflecting this prosperity, Ross enjoyed four fairs a year, more than any other town in Ireland at the time. So, um, this panel depicts a fair day in Ross in about 1220, when the town is beginning to realize its full potential. As a foreign jester entertains the crowd, the Italian bankers and tax collectors can be seen standing behind their checkered, checkered cloth, the source of the word exchequer. The stalls are full of goods and they once more reflect the success of the port of Ross. The last panel, 15, is the sheep of corn and the distaff descent. Um, in this panel, we see the five great granddaughters of Dermot McMurrow, Matilda, Aoife, Sybil, Joan, and Maud. They are sitting with their panel, parents in a garden, singing and playing music, which William Marshall may very well have taught them. So even though there were 10 children, all, all, the, um, all the sons married, but they had no um, descendants. And the women, in, in the end, the women's really inherit, the women, the daughters really inherited everything. On the other side of the panel, this is Aoife, um, sitting alone under the, uh, uh, with her dog beside her in the shelter of the McMurr emblem, which is a sheaf of corn. So here's the sheaf of corn. The marriage of Strongbow and Aoife is an important part of Irish history and has inspired other artworks, including this very large, 10 feet high by 17 feet wide, oil on canvas painting by Daniel McLeese, painted in 1854. It's on permanent display in the National Gallery of Ireland in Dublin, and Bob and I did um, get to see the painting. It's pretty impressive. Um, the, weddings, the wedding actually took place in Christchurch Cathedral, Waterford. So both this and the image on the panel, on panel six, um, reflect some artistic license. It's really, there's incredible detail. You can see the harp, whoops, <laughs> see the harp of Ireland with broken strings and you can see the defeated um, Irish down here. So this is definitely from the Norman perspective, uh, taking a very positive view of the, of the wedding. The website for the tapestry has tapestry project has lots more information. So this is the URL for anyone who wants to learn more. So that's it for me. So how do I how do I unshare? There we go. All right. We got you, Cindy. Thank you. Uh, any questions? Raise your hand if you can. Michael. So I love the I love the history, and I appreciated that you said it was from the Norman point of view. Uh, Dermot, in this narrative, is represented as the patriarch of this whole thing. Every reference I've heard to Dermot when I was in Ireland was followed by the appellation the traitor, Dermot the traitor. Can you say more about that? Did you encounter that perspective while you were traveling? Um, I hadn't heard him described in quite that way. Um, I do think part of the reason that he was deposed as king as people, the other, the other kings. So at the time, um, you know, there was a high king and then there were a number of, lo of lower level kings. And the other kings really viewed Dermot as, um, too aggressive, you know, he was too quick to want to take over their territories. And so that may have to do with it. Um, I mean, I'm not an expert in Irish history. I, we didn't really talk about um, this with anybody while we were in England. So I didn't hear him described as a traitor, but I know that he wasn't always popular. And this, the, the tapestries and the descriptions of things on the, on the uh, Tapestry Project website are definitely from the Norman perspective. 
William, you're up. Yeah, I was under the impression that corn came from the Americas in the 1500s. And yet you describe the symbol as being the sheath of corn. I, I in all honesty, I don't know. In England, corn is. Oh, like Bob, so Bob was corn before the American. Okay, okay, so Bob says that in England, um, the word corn was used to des describe any sort of grain. So this was probably more likely wheat than corn than what we think of as corn. Right. In England, it's still. Um, corn is still stands for wheat, basically. Yeah, like corn dollies and things like that. Think about that. Linda Jack, unmute. There you go. Thank you, Cindy. Um, I know all these people, so <laughs> I was thrilled. Well, at least the Norman side, not so much the <laughs> Irish side. Um, yeah. And I was just reminded. Um, in this talk that the uh, in the medieval period, the politics of family history was really dominated everything. So it was sort of interesting, especially the Marshall family that was so important. So it was um, fascinating to learn. I'd never heard of this tapestry and it was sort of like meeting old friends. So thank you very much for doing that. Oh, you're welcome. You're welcome. They're Linda Papanicolo asked a question in the chat. Are you are you receiving, Linda? What's your question? In the chat. Sorry. Can you? I can't hear you, Linda. Oh no, I didn't have a question. I was just a comment. Oh no, Linda. Linda P. No, no there is actually a question okay. from. Yeah, uh, I'm not sure what uh, a W O A style is. Can't hear you yet. She's working on it. Got it. There's the unmute. WPA. I'm, I'm I'm inputting from my iPhone this evening. I have a complicated arrangement. Um, I found that it was a little bit uh, distant, concerning because I kept wanting to see a Bayou tapestry style in these things. And it looks kind of Renaissance or Works Progress Administration. So, and they're beautiful. But uh, so who was the designer of these? Um, if you if you wait a couple minutes, I can probably look it up on the Ross Tapestry website. There was a local artist, the same person as I, I, I believe, if I'm remembering correctly, the same person did all of the cartoons and uh, the same sti same uh, stitchery expert um, taught the stitches. So it's, it's, it's not it's, it's, it's not like the Bayou Tapestry in the sense that the Bayou Tapestry is woven. This is yeah. de definitely embroidered. I thought the Bayou Tapestry was embroidered, isn't it? I don't. Well, my other question was, I can remember my mother going through a period of doing cruel embroidery. So as I was looking at these uh, tapestries, some of them looked with colored backgrounds as if the whole surface of the linen is embroidered. And some of them had linen colored backgrounds. So uh, is the entire surface covered with embroidery or um, like sort of like needlepoint or? I mean, <laughs> Bob is better at answering these questions than I am. <laughs> Go ahead, Bob. I'm going to mute. I'm going to mute. Okay. If, if you take your headphones off, then you won't hear an echo. Um, okay. So first of all, well, the the bio tapestry is made much like this. It is embroidered, not oh, really is. woven, but. Uh, this was inspired by the look of the bio tapestry in the sense that it's got little banners at the top and the bottom and it shows other little uh, incidents going along the side, but it isn't trying to imitate the bio tapestry in any other way, certainly not in style. And it's a modern, uh, a modern work. So there was, I, sense, I think a sense of making it a modern work in modern style and uh, that's what we've got. And I think some of them are amazing because of the perspective. The one where uh, mm -hmm. the soldiers are looking down from way above at the siege below. And there's one where the gesture is in the front and he's, he almost fills a third of the panel uh, in front of all the fare that's going on in the background. So 
Um, I don't know if that answers your question or not, but yeah, <laughs> so. yeah, yeah, it, it does. I, okay, so I just went. Sorry, yeah. I just went and looked at. Hang, hang on a second. I went and looked at one of the close-ups of the of the panel so I could get a better sense. And it seemed to me, at least for the one or two that I took a quick look at, that the main part of every panel really is is covered um, with stitches. You know, there's no part of the main panel where the linen shows through. But if you look at the top and bottom borders, um, there, that's not the case. It's it, there's a little bit of embroidery, and but you definitely see part of the linen. So that helps. Interesting. Thank you. Next question comes from Kathleen. It's not a question. If you look at the background of my picture, you'll see some of the Bayou tapestry. Right. Can everybody see that? Yes, we can. Okay, well, it okay. clearly, it, it was definitely mostly linen, and you can see the background through a lot of it. And then the stitching is mostly wool, <clears throat> is wool. And you can see how that uh, is drawn with, <clears throat> with, as you pointed out, the top and bottom borders. Now, the, the other one, the, the Ross tapestry, looks more to me like the 15th and 16th century Belgian tapestries, but they were definitely woven. They were not embroidered. I'm talking about the style of it, the look of it. If you look at the two, the Ross tapestry doesn't look like the uh, Bayou tapestry. It looks more like the, the Belgian ones, but it's done in the style of the Bayou tapestry with embroidery, not weaving. Hmm. Any other questions? Thank you, Cindy. You're welcome. Great to see. Evelyn, back to you. We I'm going to Dick now with the arches. Ready? You know, I'll just press share screen. It says imaging vaults. Okay, so I attended a Zoom session of three days and this book is the result of that session. What these guys have been doing is a lot of work on measuring and exhibiting vaults. Um, one of the things that they're very much into is point clouds. And here's an example of a point cloud. It is simply a representation with little tiny pieces of Um, video or uh, graphic for each point that a laser has picked up on this structure. So it looks very fuzzy and that's why it's called a cloud. A lot of the people go to a religious structure of some kind and look at the vaults with the laser and they get a point cloud of the vault. And the next thing that happens is that they make a mesh, as you see on the left here, that is based on the point cloud. Okay, so what they do with their mesh faces is they make a normal a vector to it, a point straight out from that mesh face. And here is a diagram of the mesh face and a vector pointing out of it and the vector related to the X, Y, and Z axes. <coughs> Um, one of the ways that they map vaults is called a Z component normal vector mapping. And that, what that means is they, they take, well, here, here is an example of it. This is a close up of that one that was circled in the previous slide. What it means is that they take this vector and they take its component along the Z axis. And then the plot that you saw in the previous slide is a plot of all of these vectors. It just the Z component of a vector. Now, when you get a vector that points some random direction, it's got an X component, a Y component, and a Z component. 
uh, you can create the vector by going x, y, and z, or you can create it by going x, z, and y, or you can create it by going z, x, and y, or you can create it by going z, y, and x, or you can create it by going y, x, and z, or you can create it by going y, z, and x, but there's more. You can also create this, this z component of the vector by going across the x, y face down the z, or you can go across the y, z face and cross on the x, or you can do this, but the one that you want is this one. And this z component of the vector is what they are mapping, and this vector is straight out from the little um, triangle of the mesh. Okay, so there is this facet of the mesh, there is this normal vector to that facet, and here is the z component. Now, my contention is this means almost nothing to anybody. It certainly means nothing to me, but you can do something about that. If you start here and you look at what that is, you are looking at the edge view of the facet, the normal vector, the xy vector, and the z vector. So what this is, edge view of the xy plane, edge view of the facet, it's the angle. It's got to do with this angle beta, which is the angle of the facet to the horizontal xy plane. And in fact, by definition, this z vector's magnitude is the cosine of beta. So what that means is that you can find out beta. And here's what beta is. It's the arc cosine of z. Now, once you know beta, it almost starts to make sense because beta is the angle of this facet to the xy plane. So for instance, if you have a hemispherical zone, then right here, a facet of that zone is going to be 90 degrees and so on. So you can draw these different zones at different colors and get some kind of a plan that has something to do with what, how, the, how the structure vary, uh, the angle of the structure at each point between that point and, the, and this horizontal plane. Now, you can, if you want to, go along for every degree of beta from zero to 90 and assign a color to it. So you can say when beta is zero, that is when the, <clears throat> when the little segment is perfectly flat, say parallel to this xy plane, you get a black color. And when it's perfectly vertical, you get a perfectly white color, and in between are all these other colors. So this, this is 90 different colors for the 90 different degrees of a, of a, of a dome looked at from below. This, was, this one with white representing vertical, and this one with black representing vertical. Um, as you might imagine, this is very tedious because you have to enter each of these colors by hand. And so it takes a long time. Um, the, my idea was that 91 colors is probably more than you might need. So here are some alternatives. Now, this one is going to be, this one was actually, well, the one that we just saw, that those two domes were 91 colors. And the one that we saw initially was 10 colors, which looked like a, a funny kind of donut. So one could think about, let's try 45 colors. In that case, you get this arc and you get, if you were going to represent say a barrel vault, it would look like this from below with these colors. Um, but there's something wrong with this. 
What's wrong with it is that it should be 46 colors because you have 46 possible colors, you have 45 divisions. So what you do is you divide the first division into two pieces and only use half of it for the first color. And you use half of the last division for the last color. And then you get something that looks like this. And this is not bad for 45 colors instead of 90. It's a lot less work. And then a barrel vault here looks like this. You may not have noticed that the barrel vault represented in the previous uh, iteration where there were 45 instead of 46 was a little bit too white in a long stripe in the center. And of course, a little bit too white in a tiny dot in the center of this one. So let's talk about trying to make a rib. Well, a rib is just like this, which was the basis for both this one and this one, but the rib is smaller. So we go in a flat uh, increment and make one of these reduced in scale. And this is what the rib vault looks like. So that's cool. Um, and we can then think, aha, if we can do a rib, we can do a cross rib. And that's easy. You just stretch this thing out by a factor of the square root of two and make two of them across. And look, you've got a ribbed vault with two, two ribs. There's, there is a trouble with it though. These ribs, if you just stretch them like that, you're simply making a circle that's bigger and they don't fit inside the vault. So the solution, I decided to try just 17 shades of gray. And here is what you get. When you multiply the rib by square root of two, you get a circle that's bigger. What you really want is an ellipse that's that much bigger, but no bigger in height. And that's, that's the kind of rib that you would want if you had two of those, of those barrel vaults intersecting. It has to be an ellipse. And if you look, when you project these colors, the spacing is different. So you should see a rib that looks like this and, and what you saw in the previous picture was a rib that looks like this. So that's pretty much where it is. Um, going back to the 89 shades of gray, this is a revision that starts with the first one being only half a degree and the last one being uh, half a degree. So you fit 91 colors into 90 spaces. And that's about where I am. This is something that I don't know when it will be finished and I don't know how much more there will be to it, but this is what there is right now. So that, that is the presentation. Do we have questions from the floor or comments? Well, I didn't know what was going on, but Dick sure did make it sound interesting. <laughs> <laughs> And I'd like to, to follow on with it. It's tedious because oh, you, you have to every every good one of those colors has to be entered by hand in its little space. You go for it, Dick. Yeah, that's that's one reason it's no more finished than it is because I've got other things to do besides that. William, yes, I, I think. It, it, what I saw seems to be the foundation work for computer aided design. Well, it, it's the the idea was to uh, see how it would look if you used the degrees instead of the z component of the vector, which is totally non-intuitive, and see whether there's some problem with the with the degrees of slope. Yeah. It seems to be a, just fine. Yeah. Uh, what, what I saw 
was a way uh, that uh, the other Boeing or Dassault uh, developed their incredibly intricate computer-aided design packages, which allow buildings by Frank Gehry to go from either a paper model to uh, an actual design right. and then be, you know, be wire, wire imaged and then filled in with whatever he wishes it to be. So I, I thank you for doing that. And it seems like uh, it is part of one of those two or more now. I mean, up, up north near the Marin County Center, we have a huge computer app, um, graphics, computer uh, aided design company. I forget the name of it at the moment, but anyway. Well, I, I would love to be able to do this using their the um, data that these guys have, but Alex was not real enthusiastic. Alex is the one of the authors of that book, uh -huh. Alexandria, Alexandra. Dra. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Well, that's it. Other questions and thoughts? Yes, Elaine, on the on the boss roof bosses of Norwich Cathedral. Okay. Um, since we've been doing more. Uh, armchair travel and we really don't have a chance to go see these places. I, I went through a lot of stuff and I found that uh, I'd forgotten how interesting the roof bosses in Norwich Cathedral were. So um, I have some books and I read up on them and so this is kind of what I found. Um, to start a little about Norwich, the city of Norwich has a long, rich medieval heritage. The Normans saw the city as an ideal place to construct a castle and ultimately locate the bishopric. The city had a contentious relationship with both ecclesiastical and civil authorities. They had numerous conflicts, the worst of which were these riots in 1272, where the, the townspeople believed that the monks were overstepping their authority. They already owned huge chunks of the city anyway. They were raising taxes and restricting access through the cathedral precincts. So it bore the brunt of their wrath and they basically um, burned every building in the cathedral complex, including the roof of um, the, the nave. So this, this is Norwich now. Now Randy took this picture, the left one from the castle. And then the one on the right is shows um, sorry shows um, the east end, the presbytery, and the the apsidal chapels. So they after the the riots, they they began a reconstruction project, and it began mainly with the bosses or the the roof in the cloister it was the first to be actually put into to stone and have stone vaults but they replaced the nave roof with wood and then a few years later the spire collapsed into the nave roof it caught fire and they replaced the roof again in wood and then about a century later another just fire destroyed the nave roof and at this point the bishop bishop lyhart decided to replace um, the wood roof with stone vaulting and he initiated the roof roof, roof boss project. He had Reginald of Ely overseeing the project and he had done work in Cambridge. So there is some similarities. So the total number of bosses includes the entire cathedral, but I'm only concentrating on the nave, the transepts, and the cloisters, and you'll see some big differences in them as we go, uh, depending on the date and the style and who was in charge. So the ones in the presbytery and the Bottom Chapel uh, are not going to be included, and they're because they are not telling a, a story. And the the interesting one about the Bottom Chapel is that it actually um, the roof bosses tell the Man of Laws story. Through the through bosses, so this just to give you an idea up close what a boss looked like. 
um, the Hales Abbey Museum in Winchcombe uh, was able to salvage some of them and they're on display and it gave us a sense of, of how exactly how big they are and uh, the, the detail work on them. So now back to Norwich, the vaults, um, the arrangement in the nave is called Lierne vaulting. So there are 24 bosses in each of the 14 bays. Each, in each bay, there's a large central boss, which they, they deemed was the main subject of that particular bay. They probably based these on um, the Norwich mystery plays, which we have, they're lost now, but uh, most of the stories would have been taken from them because they had actually seen the story and they kind of knew which, wh what they wanted to say in each nave or in each bay. So the, sorry, the, so there's a central boss and then there are 17 satellite bosses which contribute to the story. They kind of radiate around the main boss and if you know how to read them, you, it will make sense, but I don't think it's necessary to really appreciate what there is. And then the remaining bosses um, are basically just foliage or floral designs. So here, this is a diagram. This is the, the furthest west on the right is the Nave Bay um, N. And you can see they progress from east to west. The main boss is here in the center. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then these radiate out. Here on the, the left, this is one example in that I'll be showing close up of, but the central boss, you, you would read it starting at the top of the picture and then it segues down and you can go down either side to the left or right to add to the story. And then it, mm -hmm. as you get to the bottom, you can see there's um, Moses in the bulrushes. So in the nave, the, the sequence was from east to west and it was beginning with the Old Testament. There were seven. And seven in the New Testament, and the the so it goes. It starts with creation through Adam and Eve, Noah, Abraham and Isaac. It segues into Jacob's story, Joseph, Moses, and ends with David and Solomon. And then in the New Testament, it goes from the nativity to Jesus's baptism, but then it jumps clear to <coughs> supper. Um, there's Christ's arrest, the crucifixion, the ascension, and the last judgment. And just to give you an idea, um, the red arrow to the right is the beginning of the first bay. And then the arrow to the left, that is the, where the Old Testament ends and the New Testament <coughs> begins. Excuse me, I have to interrupt, Elaine. Somebody is coughing. Could you please mute yourself? We'd appreciate it. Can we mute everybody? We, we're fine now. Thank you. Okay, Bay A is creation and Adam and Eve. Uh, the very first boss shows the creation of light. Let there be light. The next one shows God blessing his creation. And you can see there's um, a, a lion, um, a cow, we think, um, and he's blessing them. And it follows, the story follows where he creates Adam and then creates Eve out of Adam's rib. But the main boss is the temptation. So. You can see they depict the, the serpent with a, a human body. Okay, the, then it segues into the second boss 
is Noah's Ark. And most of the, the it starts out, it shows different people carrying uh, animals and plants and birds into the ark. And then this is the, the main boss shows. There's birds, there's animals. And then you see Noah and his wife and his children. Then the, the one on the right, sorry, is after the flood where Noah plants his vines. One thing I noticed that most of these people are depicted wearing medieval clothing. And the other thing I noticed is that the, the use of the colors red, green, and gold are, are very prominent. And then it goes on to, to the story of Abraham. And it begins first with building the Tower of Babel, which is down on the right. You can see, obviously, what looks like a medieval workman working on it. The Tower of Babel is actually depicted as a castle. And then the main boss shows Abraham preparing to sacrifice Isaac. And the story then kind of segues through um, to Isaac. And then in the upper right, Isaac is, this is Isaac in old age. He's blind and it shows that Esau on the right is unaware that Jacob, with the connivance of his mother, Rebecca, has um, kind of disguised him to be like Esau because Esau was considered hairy. So when Isaac touches him, he thinks it's Esau and he gives him Isaac's birthright. And then Jacob here it goes, it segues into the life of Jacob, and it shows things like um, wrestling with the angel, Jacob's ladder, uh, ultimately his forgiveness from his brother, but the main boss is what's called peeling his rod, which had to do with uh, Jacob was sort of having a, a run-in with his father-in-law, partly because his Laban, his father-in-law, had tricked him into marrying his daughter Leah first before he could marry Rachel. And so they had a, a contest in which they could divide the flocks and Jacob cheated in a way to get the better of his father-in-law by um, peeling these rods to attract the animals to his water trough while during mating season and whatever offspring there were from that would be belong to Jacob. And then on the right, you can see there's um, Jacob finally marrying uh, Rachel. And then the, again, it segues again into the story of Jacob, of Joseph, who was Jacob's favorite son, who was, <clears throat> they were jealous of his brother. Uh, they were jealous. And so they sold, they put him in a pit and he was sold into slavery, but he uh, wound up in Egypt and helped Pharaoh avoid a famine. So, and then, oops, oh God. All right, now I'm, <laughs> Okay. Now, when you when you enter the nave of the, of, of the cathedral, this is the boss that just absolutely jumps out at everybody. And most people are only, they only look at the really big ones. And this is, of course, the biggest one there. Um, the story starts with Moses, which is on the right, and how Moses finally leads uh, the children of Israel out of Egypt. <clears throat> and then here's Pharaoh being drowned in the Red Sea. You can see that's a uh, East Anglican cart and a Pharaoh depicted as a king. And it ends with the coronation of David, but there are 
I couldn't find any pictures of that particular boss. The one of the Coronation of Solomon is very similar. The story continues from the previous boss with the story of Samson. So on the upper right, they have Samson and Delilah, where she is cutting off his hair. You can see she has a kind of a scissors in her hand. Uh, and then the bottom right one is David and Goliath. And it, it appears to be a, a triumph of, you know, big over li little over big. Then they begin in the, the, uh, the nave, the second half of the nave, with the nativity. And the main boss shows the Holy Family. Satellite bosses show um, the lead up, the Annunciation, shepherds. Uh, the Herod's call for the in Master of the Innocents and then the presentation. The one slide on the right is the depiction of the shepherds with their animals. And then the second one goes on to show uh, Jesus's baptism. Again, I couldn't find any pictures of that particular main boss, but uh, two of the stories they choose to depict in the satellite bosses are uh, when Jesus disputes with the elders in the temple and then his first miracle with uh, the wedding, and get, wedding at Cana where he turns the water into wine. Then it jumps clear through and the next scene is the Last Supper. You can see there's eight disciples, not the twelve. Um, You'll notice there's damage to this one, <clears throat> and that's because one of the in one of the places where there would be a boss, they had a, a large hole <coughs> that allowed a therapher in the shape of an angel to drop down and sense the the nave. And my guess is that's how it got damaged. And then one of the satellite bosses shows the disciples preparing to have their their feet washed can see in the bottom right the their shoe and his he has taken his shoe off. And it goes into uh, leads up to the crucifixion. The main boss is Jesus before Pilate. And one of the satellite bosses in it, they choose to depict uh, Peter when he cuts off the ear of the high priest. If you look you can see the man is missing his ear and that the ear is basically, you can see it on the, his sword. And then third to last bay is Jesus on the cross. You can see soldiers, various people <coughs> there with him. And then the ascension. Now, this was a hard one. I wanted to find a, a picture of this. The central boss shows Jesus ascending, but you can only see part of him. You can see his feet. Uh, this is courtesy of um, the Helter Skelter. There was a, if you remember, for a while the, the cathedrals were trying to attract people to come inside, and uh, Rochester Cathedral had a, like a miniature golf course, and they did sort of silly things like that, and, and um, so Norwich put up a helter skelter, which is, I think, like a big slide, and they made it possible for people to get up close to see some of these roof bosses. And then the final one at the west end of the nave is the Last Judgment. You can see Christ. You can see the his wounds on his hand is inside. Uh, the angels blowing the trumpet. And there are people headed either to heaven or hell. And the last two bosses are a, one of the Holy Trinity and then a rebus of Bishop Lyhart, who oversaw the creation of the vaults. So then the transept, each one of the transepts has 75 bosses. And you can tell these are different. These were, were probably begun around the year 1500. And again, the roof of the transepts caught fire, and then so they were replaced in stone. And these, there is a little bit of rhyme and reason to how these are presented. 
it's almost as if they're trying to fill in some of the blanks that were left out by those in the nave. And there's some duplication, like they show the shepherds again, uh, the massacre of the innocents, and, and Herod is there too. And then on the south part, these are um, basically the early life of uh, Christ, and then he's, there's one, he's baptized, and then to the right, he's, he's calling the disciples, and then another satellite box shows the two uh, disciples, Peter and Andrew, being called. So then you go to the cloisters, and this, this, these are the most, I think, interesting to figure out because they date anywhere from 1300 to 1500, and some over time were replaced, and there isn't, or there could be some rhyme or reason to how they're arranged, but um, there's debate on how, how they were. Um, the prior's door on the right was the main entrance into the cloister because the east side of the cloister is where there had been the monk's dormitory and other things. The monk's door on the left was actually where most visitors would come in because the first room to the right of the that door was a reception room for visitors. There was the um, guest accommodations on the, the west side of the, the um, cloister there. So if you take it from starting from the prior's door and working around, um, we'll look at each door. Oh, and then down on the, at the bottom, there was a door to the refectory. And then on the bottom right, that was called the dark entry door, which led to the infirmary. And the first room off of that door was a room where they prepared uh, bodies for burial. So if you go starting in the north cloisters from the, the prior's door, these are basically um, scenes from after the resurrection and then various miracles attributed to Mary and other saints. Uh, you have the ceiling of the tomb on the upper left. Then there's Doubting Thomas on the right. And at the bottom, a, a saint's story. This is Saint, Saint Dennis or Dionysus. You can see he's carrying his head. Then when you walk from the monk's door down to the refectory, it's scenes of the apocalypse. And this goes past the door to the refectory around the corner. But again, duplication, there's Adam and Eve. And then on the right, St. John and the angel from the book of Revelation. Then when you went on the south walk, if you went from the refectory door to the dark entry, these are more apocalyptic scenes. And then they start again on the, the coming of Jesus, mainly through the scenes of John the Baptist. And so these are both two bosses showing from the book of Revelation. And then the most interesting one really is the, the walk going from the dark entry up to the priors, up the priors door. The first half is just foliage and uh, grotesques and figures, portraits. Uh, you see fighting a dragon, a tumbler, a grotesque slaying a monster and then this is where you find the green man which is probably the most well known of all the bosses in the cathedral and some have suggested that he was may represent a wandering soul and because it was out in the cloister there was no real prohibition about putting a green man out there because it was outside the sacred area of the cathedral. So again, you have portraits and once again, going into the um, lead up to the crucifixion. Um, so most of the um, information I found was books that and publications by the cathedral itself 
and um, I have to say I've, I've been to the cathedral I, I many times they're hard to see the, these bosses are high up and unless you're prepared to lay in a pew and look with binoculars you really don't see them so uh, to, to find information that actually has some close-ups in it and to find out there was a lot of rhyme or reason to what they were doing was was really interesting. No? Thank you, Elaine. Well, then we'll move on to the final talk. Linda Papanicolo. So this is part of a, a study that I have been doing for the past uh, uh 2019 2020 at members night on on medieval poetic forms from the global middle ages as they've been uh discovered and appropriated and taken up and used by english language poets in the modern period uh and this year i'm focusing on japan i did one year french medieval poetry i did islamic and andalusian last year now japan and this is the part of the project that's most personal to me because I am a haiku writer. And as a medievalist, I've also been fascinated by the similarities and differences between European and Japanese feudal cultures. There are commonalities I found and important differences that impact the poetry and uh, are very interesting. These include religion, court patronage, literacy, the roles of women and attitudes towards sex. Okay, are you on the next slide now? Yep. Okay, good to go. Okay, we're going to be good to go. Of the two poetic forms dated from the Japanese Middle Ages that I'm going to show you. Okay, whoops, wait a minute. That's a little bit too soon. Okay. Um, so this is, this was slide two. I sort of ran through this. Uh, briefly, the periods don't quite line up. Uh, there's an early period up through uh, from 600 through 905, which corresponds to uh, the end of the uh, early Christian up through the Carolingian period. Then there's classical period that goes up into the 15th century. Um, and well, well the, that date must be wrong. Sorry about that. And then there's the medieval period goes from 1200 up to about 1600, which takes us into the Tokugawa shogunate. So this is a vast span and overall it sort of roughly corresponds to early middle and late middle ages. Similarities include castles and armor and things like that. Uh, differences include fighting methods and the way they built castles and stuff like that. But what I'm particularly interested is the impact on the poetry. And so the poetry is this. There are basically two forms that I'm going to show you. The first one is the most important one is a lovely form called the waka, also called tanka. It's a quintile, five lines, structured in syllables or on in Japanese. Japanese is not an accentual language, so uh, it plays out differently. But the syllable or on structure is five lines of five, seven, five, seven, and seven sounds. Uh, it first appeared in an early anthology collected in the court called the Manyoshu, which was uh, produced in 759 Common Era. And if you compare the timelines, uh, you'll realize that in 759, Charlemagne was not even king of the Franks yet. That's how early this poetry emerged. There are hundreds of waka in the 11th century Tale of Genji, which is a big medieval uh, literary monument of that period. Genji is the world's first novel. It was written by a woman, and it depicts a court culture in which people were educated in classical poetry. The characters compose poetry, waka, and make literary references back to the Manyoshu and other anthologies as part of the narrative development. What I'm showing you here is just one of the hundreds of uh, waka that are in the manuscript. Um, on the left, you'll see what it looks like in Japanese. I think that's modern Japanese. In the middle is a uh, phoneticized 
spelling in Roman letters. And then in the right is actually a prose translation in English, which I'll read to you. Long last we meet, only for you to leave hurriedly, so I could not recognize you, like the moon hidden behind the clouds. So it is a love poem. Uh, lots, that's what Genji is about. It's actually a very steamy love story of very continuous um, seductions and couplings and things like that. And Genji, I, one, one of my friends once said, Genji was really a cad. But at any rate, uh, this is uh, the poetry. And there are similarities in, because it's love and it's courtly poetry, some vague similarities to Western courtly poetry, but there are also some really big differences because unlike Western troubadour courtly poetry, where the lady is an unattainable object of desire for mostly male poet writers, Waka were written by both men and women and often composed as an amorous exchange of sort of morning after letters after a tryst. Here's another one from the eighth or ninth century written by a court poet who is highly admired. Her name was Lady Ise. And I'll give you the translation. A boundless main, storm tossed, you distant from my bed. Now, were I to sweep it, my sleeve might float as does the sea foam. So it's a lament for an absent lover, probably on a voyage, and it's a beautiful rendering of female erotic longing. Apparently the poem was much admired by the ladies of the court in those days. Buddhist monks and nuns also wrote waka, although theirs tend to be different, uh, more about nature, aging, and loss of spiritual, lost spiritual and uh, uh, philosophical themes. But it was the very basic poem form, and it touched also the second form that I'm going to show you. Um, the second form was called Renga. And uh, I've got one. So what we have in Ranga is still the 57577 pattern, but now it's an alternation of sort of call and response in a collaborative verse. So one poet would write the 575 and another one would write the 77. Originally, it was a just a simple two verse exchange. Uh, the extant examples of are in the Magnoshu, those are the earliest. As it developed as a literary art in the 14th century, there was an imperial anthology. And by this time, Renga had become quite elaborate. There's a hundred verse sequence called a Hyakuin. They were typically composed in live gatherings. There's an illustration of a gathering I'm showing you. And then the poem would be transcribed. The rules governing the important topics, which is the progression of seasons, love, the blossom and moon verses, and the permission of repetition and variation of topical themes became so complex that the patrons who liked to have Renga as court activities had to engage a professional Renga master to really conduct the sessions. So here is one that I'll just show you close up what they look like. This is just six verses of the opening of a Hyakuin. Um, it was conducted by a noted Renga master, Sogi, in the 15th century. And here's how it works. Sogi contributes the first poem. This is the ceremonial opening. It's called the Hoku. As it snows, the base of the mountain is misty this evening. In other words, what he's done is he's established the setting. It's a mountain landscape and there's mist. And so because it's spring is coming on, the snow is uh, steaming even as it lands. So it sets the poem in early spring and there would be a lot of other ceremonial functions with illusions. It would be honoring the host of the gathering. 
The next person in line, his co companion Shohaku, composes the response poem, which is support verse, that adds more Yaku detail. Composed Far the in the way the, the water goes, a plum blossom smelling hamlet. So he contributes. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm hearing sort of an verse. echo of myself. We're just going to have to live through it. It's not too loud, I hope. This evening. This first verse uh, the, the third verse, then, is the wind from the, the river, river, always sweeping willows, now it's spring. That's by Socho. And then we go on for three snow, more. But it's and the poem will continue like this for another 97 verses. I really love this poem because... As I read this, it seems to me like it's being in a landscape scroll. And in addition, uh, we still compose sort of similar but more simplified versions of Renga like this. So uh, I've studied them enough that I can really understand what's going on and appreciate them. And so uh, I'm a big fan of this kind of poetry. As I said, it goes on. Okay. The question then is, so how do we get with these two forms of poetry, Waka and Renga, how do we get from the Middle Ages to now, because that's my theme, middle medieval poetry forms that were taken up in the modern period. Uh, this is a really fascinating and detailed study, and I'm really in the space of a short talk giving you an overview, a very high altitude overview. Uh, the first step was the Edo, Edo period of the Tokugawa shogunate in the 17th century and up through the early 19th. Uh, this was a period that well, there was a rising merchant class, somewhat like happened in Europe during the period after the Middle Ages, uh, if, if, with a merchant class and Edo becoming the largest city in the whole world. Uh, there was a broadening of patronage to the wealthy mid uh, merchant classes, literacy increased among commoners. And while these two medieval forms continued, both Waka and Renga, uh, there were updates, uh, updates in subject matter, moving from courtly themes to uh, topics of everyday life and the language sort of simplified and modernized. Uh, the old master haiku or hoku poets of this period are Matsuo Basho, Yosabusan, and Kobayashi Isa, uh, who are poets that every high modern haiku writer knows. At the end of the Edo period uh, came the sort of one final interesting step. Um, after the Perry expedition of 1853-54, uh, the Japanese really became fascinated, you know, newly the gates thrown open so that they could really see the world rather than having it sort of filtered through uh, extreme embargo and merchants confined to Yokohama. Uh, the Japanese artists and writers became fascinated with European art, particularly the 19th century realist movements. And the fourth of the old masters, Masayoka Shiki, uh, decided that the poetry was really kind of overly refined and inbred after centuries of repetition. So he wanted to modernize. What he did was take the hoku, that three-line verse that was the beginning of Renga, and he recast it as a standalone form. It was no longer the ceremonial opening of a poem, but a sketch from life, and he renamed this haiku. So haiku really started at the end of the 19th century. Then in the early Late 19th, early 20th century, conversely, Western visitors started coming to Japan, uh, ambassadors, people that the Japanese were inviting to come and teach in their newly founded universities, uh, travelers for other reasons, scientists, literary people. They became in turn fascinated with um, Japanese arts, but the, the people who were interested in literary culture had been educated in Western poetry. And interestingly, they did not perceive haiku as poetry. The early books call them epigrams. And so 
uh, they didn't quite know what to think about them if they tried to translate the old master's haikus of Basho in particular. They were recast in a sort of florid Edwardian language that we sort of look askance at today. But pretty soon, writers were attracted to the imagistic qualities of haiku as a way to break from florid Victorian uh, poeticizing. Uh, that included the imagist poets, especially Ezra Pound. And I'm not going to read these two, but I've got them on the screen and they're in the handout. Uh, Pound wrote what is perhaps the first attempt at haiku in English. As for waka, or which we now call tonka, I looked up to see uh, who was interested in tonka. Turns out not too many people, but Amy Lowell, who was the sister of the astronomer Percival Roll. He went to Japan. He sent her a book and she got interested. So we have two very early, early 20th century poets, 1913 for Pound. Uh, I'm not sure the date of Amy Lowell's uh, Tonka, but she died in 1925, so it's pretty early. By the mid 20th century, writers were really beginning to understand the complexities of haiku. A key publication that promoted this was an English scholar, R.H. Blythe, who published a four volume book, Haiku, between 49 and 52. Uh, he was also very interested in Zen Buddhism, wrote a lot of books on Zen, and that had attracted the interest of the beat poets. And so through Blythe's interest in Zen, they found Haiku. So I've got three modern or 20th century haiku by the Beats, who really got haiku started in the Americas. Uh, the first one is Allen Ginsberg, and this one is a joke haiku. Uh, I would only be showing it to you because there's an author's note that says that it was composed in Berkeley in 1955 while he was reading Blythe. And it's what he understood as haiku, but it's kind of a dumb one. The moon over the roof, Worms in the Garden, I Rent This House. Um, I've, as I look over collections of these artists, uh, to my surprise, the author who I liked most was Jack Kerouac because he seemed to really get it. Uh, here's one of his that has a certain shock value to it but there's sort of an isness of Zen about it, and it's a well-formed haiku. Nightfall, boy smashing dandelions with a stick. Uh, there are sort of, from here, haiku has gone in a number of directions. Uh, some people still write 575, five. some have gone towards minimalism, uh, there are people who are really avant-garde, throw the baby out with the bathwater, everything but get rid of the, uh, the name haiku. Uh, it has gone in all directions and it has vastly influenced uh, 20th century American poetry. Uh, but the beats are in a way kind of the beginning. In 1968, uh, the Haiku Society of America was founded. It currently has over a thousand members. There's a Tonka Society of America founded in 2000. Uh, there's overlap between the memberships and it is smaller. Uh, we have four local haiku groups in California, but there are also haiku societies throughout the world. Uh, sometimes people compose in their native language, but the sharing is in English. Uh, there are numerous conferences, publications, and contacts tests, and we're all sort of in contact with each other over Facebook. The latest development in the history of haiku is one which nobody foresaw. The writing of haiku outside Japan, not in the Japanese language. And that's R.H. Blythe writing in 1964. So I asked myself, is this cultural appropriation or is it outreach? In this case, I think it's outreach because the Japanese poets, well, once they realized that the West was taking up haiku with such fervor, uh, they did get on board. Some of them are say, well, you know, hi, it's not haiku if it's not in Japanese. But by and large, there are a lot of Japanese scholars who 
interact with the English language groups. They translate their work, or some of them even uh, enjoy practicing writing haiku in English, and they do mentor the rest of us. Uh, there is one Japanese English language daily, Menichi Shimbun, that's been going in uh, since the 1920s. They publish a daily haiku in English column edited by a friend of mine, and they have a contest. Uh, on the right here, I have two haiku from that contest. One is in French. That was the first prize winner. Uh, fin de chimio, sous les photos de l'enfant, le printemps prené. Uh, it translates as end of chemo in the um, felt pen of a child, uh, spring uh, is reborn. Uh, the other one is happens to be a California writer, David Grayson, who's a friend of mine. He lives in North Bay. A smile composed of a thousand pixels, autumn dust. There are so many, many good poems that have been written in English and in other non-Japanese languages that I couldn't possibly do justice to them all. So what I'm going to do is take speaker's prerogative and just end with one of my own. Uh, I belong to a local club called the Yukiteki Haiku Society, uh, sort of centered between San Jose and Santa Cruz. It was founded by a Japanese couple, Kiyoshi and Kyoko Tokutomi, about 40 years ago. And although uh, a lot of us write in different styles, including some minimalist, uh, the club also as an official policy really works to deepen understanding of Japanese haiku and its history. One of the things the club does is to host a yearly international contest in memory of the Tokutomis. Uh, and the contest rules are 575, um, and to have a season word, uh, you have your choice of season words. And uh, so anyway, uh, I submitted, and this one of mine won first prize in 2014. So I'll close with this one. Morning solitude on a rippling mountain stream to fly fishermen. And a haiku. Okay. I and so if I can club get out of screen Yuki sharing, let's see what I can do about this now. Okay. Thank you, Linda. Okay. Yeah. And let's see. How do I stop share? There we go. Back. All right. Thanks. Have we uh, questions and comments? Very interesting. Hard to cover so much history and so much um, time, space, and change. I enjoyed it very much. Thank you, Linda. Thank you. I must say, of all of the uh, forms of medieval poetry I've studied, you know, survivals and revivals, uh, French form fiques were a revival. Uh, the uh, Andalusian poets were a revival, but it, the Persian, Persian and Urdu poetry that I dealt with in January was really a continuity. This is a continuity. These Japanese forms have gone continuously, and in the sheer number of people who compose them right now, they are far and above the biggest medieval survivals in the world today, and I think that's pretty cool. Yeah. More comments? Don't oh, miss Michael God. Murphy. Michael Murphy, your hand is up. Do you mean it to be? I do mean it to be, and I'm trying to figure out how to unmute myself. You got it. I have a comment and a question. The comment is to read what Bob Nyden has put in the chat. He says, a crash reduces your expensive computer to a simple stone. <laughs> in my Thanks. case, in my case, it was a, a little finger going down on the wrong key when I was hitting control save. And somehow or another, I managed to hit control K 
and disable my K key, which happens to be on my password. Oh no. Oh my so God. I'm, gonna, I'm gonna have to log in with another device and call the genius bar and see if I can get help. <laughs> Amazing. So my question, my question is that you said the rules of the contest were that you had to have a seasonal word. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't figure out which word was the seasonal word. Oh, that's, yeah, thank you very much. You know, I was wondering how much I should throw over and get seasonal words in Japan are called Kigo. And it's a leftover from, um, it's a leftover from Ranga days. Uh, that haiku is a, not a nature poetry, but a poetry of season. And so kigo are very important. They are the, the and it's, it's the, uh, the emotions attached to the seasons are the heart of the poem. Now in this particular poem, the season word that I chose was fly fisherman, which is, I believe, spring. Mm. Oh, I get it. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Susan or William Grimley? Yeah, me. I remember when I was like 17, I met Lucille Nixon. Her school uh, is named after her in Palo Alto because she won the Emperor's Prize for haiku. And I don't I have a know. book of her tonka. Excuse me? I have a book of her tonka. I found oh, it. Oh, okay. Tonka. I thought it was haiku. And she went to the Emperor's dinner for winning the, and I don't know whether she wrote it in Japanese or translate to English or, and I don't know what it is. That I, that I don't know. I have a book of her Tonka and I would imagine if she read, uh, somebody probably helped her translate. Wow. Okay. Wow, that's what I can say, wow. Because I knew the book, but I didn't realize that she had won and had actually gone to the emperor's. Oh, she had gone to the emperor's dinner. And I remember she was at dinner at our house. And she said she had flown all night and got to, just made it to the dinner or to the reading of all the haikus. And she was starving. So she went to the, the, the dinner and she quickly ate everything. But she came to the box or she came to the dinner. It was a whole fish. She didn't know what to do. So she looked around and no one had eaten anything. They were taking all their food home. So when oh, they climbed up to go home, everybody had boxes of food and she had one box with her fish. <laughs> <laughs> Great story. <laughs> Any other thoughts and stories? Well, thank you, Linda. That was lovely. Thank all four of you. Thanks, everyone. Yeah. Thanks. I'm J Elaine. I'm just so glad to have seen color photos of those bosses mm -hmm. and to see them up close. We'll never get yeah. up close yeah. ourselves. <laughs> they're, they're not regarding the ascension. That's the disappearing Christ, and right. it, uh, mm -hmm. it's an English iconography. I think. It dates from the Anglo-Saxon period, as I recall. It's character, the, the, just when you see him just sort of levitating up <laughs> from the stage behind proscenium or whatever, uh, you know, they're, they're pre all of them are pretty funny, but I do remember learning about them, the disappearing Christ in graduate school. Little feet. Uh, I've seen different, uh, I've seen different in different churches portrayals where you're just seeing his feet or wings or a cloud or something, but mm -hmm. never the whole body. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Good. Naiden, you're in line. Uh, I just wanted to say that that haiku that I put up, salon.com had a contest a number of years ago to write haiku about computers. Oh. And so that's where I got that. And I just posted the URL. If anybody wants to look, there's, I don't know, 20 of them or so. And there, anybody who uses a computer will will sympathize with all of them. <laughs> I, think there's, I think I remember among the uh, computer haiku, there's one that I have memorized. It's something like blue screen of death. No one hears your screams. <laughs>
But this is, you know, right. serious high. I know a lot of serious haiku poets who just absolutely loathe joke haiku. But I have a friend who runs a bookstore in North. Uh, he's up in Napa somewhere. And he is absolutely fascinated with these haiku, you know, joke haiku, uh, Jewish haiku. Uh, what are some of the other subgenres of these sort of popular haiku? Uh, and he said he's fascinated with how as a form, not the content, but the form, how it has caught on. Uh, it's sort of amazing. I think it's because it's simple. Uh, teachers teach it to everybody in school because of the syllables. Uh, my friends who are really into haiku absolutely loathe the focus on syllables because it ignores content that's really more important. But somehow or another, haiku is non-threatening enough that everybody sort of feels comfortable writing one. <laughs> Right. <laughs> I think that's. I, right. I like yeah. Renku also, and uh, so you know I belong to Renku groups. Uh, we don't write hundred verse Yakuin anymore. The one that we tend to gravitate to is a thirty six verse called a Kasen that was uh, begun by Matsuo Basho in the seventeenth century, and we there are a lot of shorter forms if you don't have so much time. Uh, but Renku is a lot of fun also. So Renku and Tonka, and there are a few others. Haiga, which is a uh, uh, haiku plus an image, or Haibun, which is a sort of a, a, an essay combined with a haiku. Uh, these are all practiced today. Um, it's not just haiku. There's just an awful lot going on. <laughs> what is a joke haiku? An example um, of a joke haiku. I can, I'm not been able to do one in 575, but the one I can think of uh, is a haiku is about two things that don't go together. Rhinoceros. <laughs> <laughs> uh, an off-the-wall thought just came to me. Joke haiku versus limerick, and I must admit I'm a fan of limericks. Yeah. <laughs> Any similarity? I don't, well, no, I don't think so. You know, I mean, the thing is that this structure, basic structure, now, um, one of the problems with 575 and the 77 is that Japanese is so uh, different from English that uh, I love 575 <coughs> haiku well written. They have just sort of the classic elegance. Uh, but friends who are Japanese have told me that if you take an English language poem and you translate it back into Japanese, the 575 in English becomes too long in Japanese. So one of the things that people argue is make them shorter. Uh, maybe a four syllable, six syllables, four syllables, or the Haiku Society of America has tended to um, produce a, a very free verse um, influenced form, which is just, you know, can be really, really short or even minimalist. The record for short is one word written by Cor van den Heuvel is one of the really big names. In 1964, he published a chapbook that had on one page, just one word in the middle, tundra. <laughs> and uh, people have been trying with less success to do it ever since. Uh, but uh, <coughs> the, any rate, the, well, I don't remember where I got started with that. Um, the the prob the problem is that uh, the two languages are not similar, and there are a lot of subtle differences. I mean, one of the things that interests me is that haiku, and I think it's partly the the Zen connection, uh, is that haiku is the art of what is not said. You know, if you think in terms of Wordsworth or somebody, they just go on talking and talking and talking and talking, and basically they're telling you what to think. And the haiku, they will just sort of drop something in like a stone into water, 
and then you watch the ripples. Mm. And so, you know, when you get seriously into it, that becomes that becomes the real goal, trying to uh, write what isn't said. I can manage it. And that poem, the um, the poem that I of mine that I read you at the end, um, the, uh, the 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 judge the judges for that contest are in Japan, and they spoke about uh, the solitude of two fly fishermen, each in their own solitude. That really spoke to them. That's why that one won. Mm. Mm -hmm. Susan, well, I was going to say I think. Um, Grindley, they were before me. Did you have a comment? Oh, sorry, no more. How no do more. I take it down? <laughs> sorry, it's all right. Well, I was sort of enchanted by the suggestion about um, uh, a limerick because both of those examples of um, of poetry had a kind of surprise at the very end on the last line, um, sort of making sense of what went before. And I, I thought that was an interesting comparison. Mm -hmm. you know, thank you. That was a very important point that you brought up. First thing, let me back up to that. As Limerick reminds me, um, one thing that's been said is that the 575 uh, is embedded in the Japanese language. And so that's, and obviously it is, I mean, it has been the basis of their poetry since the eighth century. Uh, as for the surprise in line three, yes, exactly. Uh, with three short lines, what you, I mean, uh, what you want for a strong haiku is always that the third line is not predictable from the first two. That is a really important quality. Thanks for that. Yeah, you got it. Thank you very much for bringing that up. <laughs> And Linda Jack put a comment in the chat. I'd like to read to you in case you haven't seen it. She says, thank you one and all for your contributions to this multi-decade community. Happy holidays yeah. and may the new year bring health and happiness to one and all. Thank you, Linda. Yeah. <laughs> thank you, yes, yes, absolutely. Thank you. Any, any parting words, Evelyn? No, I don't think so. Linda said it perfectly for all of us. That's right. Yes. See, see everybody in January. All right. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Yeah. Yeah. Linda's probably bye -bye. drinking eggnog. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> they got snow up there. Bye bye, Merry Christmas, folks. Bye bye. Oh, bye, bye bye. Nice.